Uh, welcome everyone to Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. My name is Claire Haley. I'm the Vice President of Public Relations and Programs here for the History Center. It's absolutely my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event featuring Tamiko Brown Nagan, uh, talking about her newest book just out very recently called Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality. If you haven't yet purchased your copy of the book, you are missing out. It's an incredible story about an incredible woman. Uh, you can find a link to purchase the book from Atlanta History Center in the chat. Uh, tonight's 25% off, um, and we offer uh, domestic U.S. shipping as well as in-store pickup if you're local to the Atlanta area. So we encourage you um, to support Dean Brown Nagan and uh, the book and purchase your copy from Atlanta History Center. Helps inform the New York Times bestseller list. Again, tonight's guest is Tamiko Brown-Nagan. She is the Dean of Harvard's Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, the Daniel P.S. Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School, and Professor of History at Harvard University's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. She was appointed Chair of the Presidential Committee on Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery in 2019, and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Law Institute. She has many other accolades, uh, which we can't quite get to in our short intro tonight, uh, but rest assured you are in for just a really wonderful conversation. She is in conversation tonight with Rose Scott. If you're familiar at all with Atlanta, you know Rose Scott's voice over the airways. She is an award-winning journalist, um, has been reporting in Atlanta for more than two decades, and is currently the host of Closer Look on WABE 90.1, who just had a really cool rebrand. So Anyway, welcome, Rose. We're so happy to have you here tonight. I'm now going to turn it over to um, Dean Brown Nagan. She has a reading that she's going to do from the book, and then we'll move on to the conversation. So thank you again for being here. Wonderful. And thank you, Claire and the Atlanta History Center for having me, and also for to, to Rose Scott for joining me in conversation. I'm excited to be here. And I'm going to read a selection from a chapter of my book on Motley's most famous case, which was the battle to desegregate Ole Miss. This man has got to be crazy, Thurgood Marshall yelled to Motley in January of 1961. That's your case. Marshall had descended upon Motley's office waving a letter from James Meredith. The missive contained such a preposterous idea that Marshall thought the writer must be out of his mind. I am submitting an application for admission to the University of Mississippi, Meredith wrote, and I am anticipating encountering difficulties with the various agencies here in the state. In view of the brewing trouble, Meredith requested Marshall's legal assistance. After Marshall finished laughing about Meredith's proposal to sue Ole Miss, he washed his hands of the case. Marshall knew Connie, Connie Baker Motley had the smarts and courtroom skills to do the job, and he thought her gender would be an advantage. The fight to desegregate Ole Miss might get someone killed, but in the context of Mississippi's white supremacist yet chivalrous culture, as Marshall saw it, a black woman would fare better than a black man. Any white supremacist, he opined, would scarcely think twice about murdering a black man but might hesitate to lynch a black woman. The very idea of a black woman lawyer violently clashed with the worldview of Dugas Shands Esquire, the white male lawyer who defended Ole Miss. Shands refused to address the ink fund lawyer in the customary manner as Mrs. Motley. Instead, he used only indirect references, calling Motley her or she. At one point early on, Motley jumped to her feet in a bid to put an end to the charade. But the tipping point occurred when Shans called her Constance. Motley immediately objected. I would like for Mr. Shans not to call me by my first name, Motley insisted. Henceforth, the lawyer referred to Motley as the New York Council. After months of struggle and endless delays, Meredith had had enough. Browbeaten by white resistance, Meredith wrote to Motley, resigned. I will not attempt to obtain an undergraduate degree from the University of Mississippi, the letter proclaimed, keenly aware that Motley, who had poured herself into the case, 
would be disappointed in his decision, Meredith pleaded for understanding. I am human after all, he wrote. Meredith had grown tired of waiting for a deliverance that never came. Life had passed him by. His peers had graduated from college, begun careers and moved on with their lives. In the meantime, he and his family had endured a high cost, literally and figuratively, fighting to integrate the University of Mississippi. Motley was stunned by the message. In order to salvage her case and support her client, Motley morphed from lawyer to therapist, a role she often played in high stakes civil rights cases. To get a handle on the fraught situation, the pair would talk in Motley's New York City apartment where Meredith could taste freedom. There, Motley cajoled Meredith. She persuaded him that he had gone too far and that too much had been invested in the case by the Inc. Fund and the Federal Court of Appeals to abandon the litigation. Just as Meredith reached his breaking point, support arrived precisely as Motley had promised. On September 10th, 1962, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black intervened, halting any further action preventing James Meredith's matriculation to Old Miss. While in Mississippi, Motley built community with a small band of lawyers and activists who took part in LDF's effort to end Jim Crow in the state. She leaned on Megger Evers, the NAACP's most prominent operative in Mississippi, who often invited Motley to his home where she enjoyed home-cooked meals and fellowship with Evers, his wife, and their children. But only one month after Motley left Mississippi for the last time, Megger Evers was assassinated. It devastated her. Motley couldn't get out of bed for weeks following his death. She couldn't even bring herself to attend his funeral. Nevertheless, she had left the state victorious. Constance Baker Motley emerged as one of the most respected lawyers in America. A story in the New York Times titled Integration's Advocate captured the professional heights to which Motley had soared. And I'm quoting, a tall striking woman with piercing dark eyes is almost always in the courtroom in the eye of the hurricane surrounding the struggle for civil rights in the South. Motley's fight to desegregate Ole Miss brought her public esteem and professional success along with devastating loss and profound pain. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. And again, welcome everyone. And full disclosure, Dean, and, and this is how people I want you to know, you believe me, that's from page 176. That is the exact excerpt that I had chosen. Oh. You can see it. I got it highlighted. <laughs> that is the okay. excerpt that I was going to reference. Um, wow, how about that? Um, and again, welcome everyone. You know, one of my favorite quotes uh, from an extraordinary person, Dean, is, is Ida B. Wells from her autobiography, Crusade for Justice. And she says, quote, there must always be a remedy for wrong and injustice if we only know how to find it. Mm -hmm. And that's also a tenet to my approach as a journalist. So that's why I'm really excited to be in conversation with you and also to talk about this extraordinary person, Constance Baker Motley, and of course your book, uh, The Struggle for Equality. Before we start our conversation, we do wanna invite the virtual audience to drop in your questions into the Q&A. I promise we'll weave some of them into our conversation. So um, please do so. And again, just drop your question to the Q&A chat box. Um, but Dean, I wanna begin with something that is so striking for me because in preparing for this interview, I went online and, and I, I saw a lot of interviews with, with Constance Baker Marley. What stood out to me was this, this very, visible innate desire she possessed and finding through the legal corridors a remedy for wrong and justice which is what I referenced with um with Ida B. Wells there and that that's that what was so apparent for me we can't describe this woman in one sentence but if you had to how would you describe Constance Baker Motley to someone who did knew nothing about her hmm well, in one word, I would say she was fierce, just fierce, and yet a, a reserved person, uh, regal. Uh, it, it's not just me who 
have referred to her as a queen. It, it I got the title from a journalist who crowned her the queen. And it's interesting when I was interviewing various people, including her clerks, people would call her a queen. And this was before they knew that my book was gonna be titled a uh, queen. She was regal in her presence and uh, just committed to the struggle for equality. And um, the James Meredith case, the struggle to desegregate Old Miss really brings to the fore how much she had to sacrifice. Uh, she litigated that case going to Mississippi time and time again under threat of her life. Uh, she just got out in time, uh, essentially, is the way that she felt. And um, it, it, there are many moments of struggle. You know, she had a, uh, a young son and a husband back in New York, and uh, she only was able to leave them behind because she felt that she was on a mission um, to set things right for African-Americans. In the book, you take the reader, before you take the reader through her life, you make it very clear that a good part of why you're doing and why you wrote this book is because there has been little recognition and historical recognition for this woman. That's at the core of what led you to, to start writing this book. That's right. And uh, I should say that I came to, to know about how relatively little had been written about Constance Baker Motley when I wrote my book, Courage to Dissent, about the struggle for civil rights in Atlanta. Um, uh, Motley litigated the Atlanta school desegregation case all the way to the Supreme Court, spent plenty of time in Atlanta. And uh, a part of my method for drawing people into that story was to write a biographical sketch of uh, each lawyer, including Motley. And I was just you know, blown away by how, again, relatively little there was out there. Um, and I wanted to correct that. I, I think we lose out uh, when we don't understand the full range of individuals who contributed to the struggle for civil rights. And certainly when we lose the lens of gender, um, it matters to tell the story of the black freedom movement through the eyes of a woman. Um, and it's inspiring. Uh, to, to know her story. And uh, I, I've, it was just a, a labor of love to write this book. You, and I don't want to give too much away because I know some folks don't have their books, but I have mine. But the very first page, we read a poem from a very young, I think she's 15 years old. Yes. Uh, striking uh, what she writes. Do you want to share some of that with the audience? Sure. Um, let's see. Where's my, what do I have here? Um, I'll read you some of her words. Uh, it was extraordinary. I was, I had the pleasure of being given this poem by a family member who thought it was so striking. It's titled, Listen Lord from the Slums. Someone told me that God made the world and everything from stone to wood. And we, when he had finished it, he said that it was good. He worked on it six long days. On the seventh, he rested content. But I've often wondered if this is the place he meant. And so she goes on to talk about her surroundings in New Haven. And she says, you know, I don't think this is the world that God uh, invented. That's not what he meant to, meant to, to uh, create. And so she was talking about the, you know, the conditions of poverty the discrimination and Rose, she was 15 years old. So already that, that uh, sense of mission uh, had developed in her. At and that, that, that sense of mission stayed with her obviously, but we should note her parents at first weren't on too on board with the whole, this is the, the path, this is my path that I'm seeking here, mom and dad. They were not, um, and it's, it's uh, just an intriguing part of the story. Um, and there, there are two parts of the story. First of all, you know, her, her background, her parents were West Indian immigrants, was defining for her. Um, they taught her to be culturally conservative. Uh, she believed in the politics of respectability. Uh, they um, 
they liked being a part of the, the British Empire. Uh, they taught her as well um, that she and West Indians were special. And her father in particular looked down upon uh, African-Americans, uh, Southern Blacks in particular, saying that um, they sort of allowed themselves to be debased by Jim Crow. Um, and yet that her, her parents' deep interest in her uh, and belief in her were vital to her aspirations. And yet uh, neither parent thought that she would get very far in the law. Um, her parents and uh, others whom she divulged her interest in law school to um, said, you got to be crazy. Uh, women, women don't become lawyers. And, and certainly it was just a curious aspiration for a young Black girl from the working class in New Haven. Do you tell the reader, do you take the reader through when that that ideology changed for them when, the, when their parents' ideology of this is what we think is gonna happen. Do you take the reader through how that, that, that transform, how that changed has Motley begin to, you know, her legal career? Yeah, I, I don't talk very much about um, uh, her parents and their perspective on her career. Her father died relatively early um, in her career, uh, but I, I do know and I do say that her, her mother certainly you know, was very proud of her and her whole family was proud of her. She maintained ties to her family, the extended family in New Haven for many years, um, took care of them. And uh, ultimately you know, she had a strong support network in her family as well as in friends. Uh, and of course I do tell the story about how she was able to go to college because of the support of a New Haven uh, contractor, philanthropist, who paid for her college and her law school after being so impressed with a talk that she gave uh, at a community center in New Haven. Let's advance a little bit and let's talk about mentors and sponsors, but let's get into the first meeting with Thurgood Marshall. Mm -hmm. Well, the story I tell is, uh, is about how Marshall hired her on the spot um, when she came to the law office as a student at Columbia Law School. Uh, he was impressed with her. He um, told her stories about the women in his life who had been school teachers, of course, a tradition in the Black community, the strong Black uh, middle class. Um, and, you know, in hiring her, he was doing something that others certainly were not. Uh, she tried to get a job at a law firm in New York, which is the most lucrative uh, part of the legal profession. And she recounts how the, the white male partner took one look at her and essentially closed the door in her face. Whereas Thurgood Marshall um, was impressed by her, hired her. I also note um, uh, that he, uh, he, he asked her to, to climb a ladder um, during that first interview, evidently, uh, and was sort of admiring her, her figure. Um, which is a little jarring to modern ears. And yet, as I explain in the book, um, you know, this is an era when Jet Magazine had a centerfold, right? Mm -hmm. And it was perceived as a compliment for men to respond to women in that way. Um, and I did want to include that part of the story in the book uh, uh, in order to reinforce that we're telling the story through the eyes of a woman. And I think for many women, that is a completely relatable uh, story. Their, their relationship in terms of working together, obviously one aspect, but the personal respect that they had for each other, you draw on that in the book. Yes, absolutely. You know, he, she often said that he made her career. 
Um, if there had not been, if it had not been for Thurgood Marshall, no one ever would have heard of Constance Baker Motley, she said. Uh, so, um, and, and he said of her that Connie just walked in and took over, uh, meaning she litigated you know, hundreds of cases for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and developed a reputation as an excellent lawyer, particularly on uh, cross-examining um, uh, segregationists who uh, just were not accustomed at all to being questioned by a black person, certainly not a black woman. And uh, Marshall supported her career and was there uh, with her, including on the day that she was sworn in as the first black woman to have a seat on the federal judiciary. And we should, this is probably a good time to talk about uh, Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson and that move and the feedback, if you want to call it that, <laughs> that uh, President Johnson received um, some very, let's just call it what it is, hateful and, and, and racist responses to, to what he had, to what he had done. And you, you lay it out in the book and in 2022, we think about it, we read about it. Oh yeah, that, that happened. But in that moment, we're talking about in the sixties here and, and people should understand that this could have been life-threatening to, mm. to her, you know, with this appointment. Mm. Well, um, there, there are two things to, I would say about that. First of all, Lyndon Johnson was so proud to have appointed Constance Baker Motley to the bench. Um, and he vetted her comprehensively, talked to uh, all of the, you know, the civil rights establishment, talked to uh, some of the judges um, who had heard her argue, um, even Supreme Court uh, justices and others in the federal government. And uh, she was, you know, she was, people thought very highly of her. Um, at the same time, there was pushback after the appointment, uh, after she was sworn in and along the way, um, there were some who said, and I'm talking about uh, you know, white liberals in New York uh, who, who said um, that her practice experience as a civil rights lawyer was too narrow for the federal district court and, you have to note that the uh, district court that she joined in Manhattan was nations and still is the nation's most prestigious. Uh, the judges hear a lot of financial litigation um, and there were those who thought that she wasn't suitable. And uh, after she was appointed, uh, some people did write into uh, Lyndon Johnson and say that, you know, why did you do this? The bench has been been preserved for legal scholars and, you know, people who are well known uh, in, in, in the crowd that was complaining. And I quote, and it's the last sentence of that chapter, uh, the administration, one of uh, Johnson's aides writing back, you know, she was not appointed because she was a Negro. She indeed is well qualified for the position, which is, you know, I thought it was important to end on that note. And that was after a, a scathing let, letter, I believe, from a, a white woman who wrote just some very <laughs> nasty comments. I, I want to go back for a moment because when we were talking about mentors, um, what about in terms of women? Who who were her mentors? Who were the folks that she looked to in, in those times where maybe she was having some issues or someone she confided in? Who mm -hmm. were those women in her life? Um, I would point to when she was growing up, uh, two white school teachers um, in New Haven who exposed her to things that she couldn't have been exposed to, like camping and uh, you know, just being in nature, having teas, talking about literature. Um, they did that for her and she was grateful and introduced her uh, to the writing of W.B. Du Bois and James Weldon Johnson. And that was very important to her initial interest in being a civil rights lawyer. Uh, she thought of Jane Bolin 
as a, a role model. Jane Bolin was the first black woman graduate of Yale Law School and went on to an appointment on the New York uh, Domestic Relations Court. And then during her career, she, um, she turned to people like Bella Abzug, who was her law school classmate and the first woman elected to Congress from New York, Shirley Chisholm, uh, Pauli Murray, all of these women were in struggle together. And that's a point that I make in the book. They had different approaches, different personalities. Motley uh, was, you know, in many ways more moderate and uh, reserved, wore a mask in a way that uh, the others likely did not. Uh, but they, they were a support group, I would say for her. When you say wore a mask, dissect that a little further for our sure. audience. Well, um, she, she kept herself to herself. Uh, she uh, had a, this imperial demeanor. Um, she held herself back a bit. And I think it's a way of being that one can notice in many you know, black women leaders in history and probably uh, in the present. Um, just holding uh, some of oneself back as a way of protecting oneself. Um, but also, I think it reflected Motley's own personality. Um, she, was, she, was, uh, she was reserved. She was private. Um, and uh, one of the you know, really neat things about writing this book was figuring all of that out because she wasn't helping me uh, through the that things. Was my yeah. yeah, that was. I, that's actually one of my questions because in your research for this, I, I wanted to know how did, were you able to dig up and, and find some some more intimate details beyond besides what, you know her legal profession or legal career. I was as a result of speaking to uh, her colleagues, uh, friends family members, it really rose was like, you know, a, de a detective story, uh, you know, just trying to figure out how the pieces fit together. And she wrote an autobiography, which was helpful in terms of uh, establishing the scope of her uh, legal career and even some reflections on life once she was on the bench, but there was very little personal in there. And so I read that book so many times, just looking for any little thing, any clue um, about her interior life. And I was able to piece some things together and I'm very grateful to the people who sat down for interviews with me because it was, it was just so vital, helpful to me. Well, that's where I want to shift next and talk about your, your approach, which was tougher, the researching or the writing? Mm. Well, um, you know, I love to write. I really do. I, I love to um, uh, craft sentences and try to find just the right word for what I want to convey. Um, there was a lot of writing with this book. It, it's, it's um, uh, I think, about 450 pages. And so to the extent that I was doing a lot of it and trying to write when I was juggling many other responsibilities, that was difficult. But I would say the researching was very, very challenging because of what I was just talking about, um, really needing to try to piece together the personality of someone who was fundamentally a private person. Mm -hmm. And also just the, you know, I, I wrote about, it was, it's, a, it's a birth to death biography. And that means I had to um, do research about Nevis, went to Nevis, which was nice. <laughs> uh, it's a, you know, a beautiful island. Uh, and I actually was able to appreciate better her personality and culture from observing being on Nevis. Um, I had to learn about the history of New Haven and New York. You know, she had a career in New York City politics and that was, you know, very involved and then all of the legal cases, and then her life on the bench, which involved uh, yet another round of legal cases and personalities. And uh, I enjoyed doing the research. 
Um, but it, it was very challenging, including because, you know, biography is just a different genre. It, it demands of you a level of attention to detail. And, and frankly, with writing the biography of Constance Baker Motley, uh, I, I felt a great responsibility to get it exactly right, to do my very best um, for her. I, I was in contact with her, her family and having, I, I knew them for, I've known them now for a decade uh, because that's how long it took from idea to publication to write this book. And over time you, you get to know people and um, you, you develop bonds with them. And I, I really just wanted to get this exactly right. A decade. I'm sorry. A decade. You said yes, a decade. decade. Yeah. Because I, you know, I have my, my scholarship that I'm doing, but I have my, um, my day job, my teaching. And then I became an administrator um, at Radcliffe. And that is, uh, there's just a lot, juggling a lot of jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there with that. I, I want to also focus on another prominent notable, notable individual, obviously, and that is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and their relationship and how she came to work on a case for him. Mm -hmm. A couple of cases with him. And um, they had a great relationship. And it stands um, in contrast to some of what's been written about King and say Ella Baker, who had a difficult relationship. Um, Motley's relationship with him was very good. He spoke so highly of her. He put her in the same class as Thurgood Marshall and Clarence Darrow and others who, in his view, were uh, you know, lawyers who really supported the struggle for social justice. She um, was a movement lawyer, which is to say she was very interested in supporting the nonviolent struggle for uh, racial equality. And, and Thurgood Marshall was quite skeptical uh, of it. He, he saw King as an upstart and he was concerned that the protest would get someone killed. Uh, he was concerned about um, you know, the way in which the needing to bail out protesters drained resources. Uh, and, but Motley really admired King and she represented him in Albany um, when he was jailed during those protests. And then she represented him and the Birmingham movement uh, a year later in an in a incredibly vital way. Um, she helped get him released when he was in the Birmingham jail. And then when the Birmingham movement turned to using children um, in the mass movement, there was retaliation by the school superintendent. He suspended or expelled all of those children and Motley went to court uh, and had that reversed. And so there's a, a, a way in which she, she's a savior of the movement in Birmingham, little known chapter. Medgar Evans, Medgar Evans, Malcolm X, Dr. King, obviously those three notable assassinations, so many folks who lost their lives. Do you give the, the reader some insight into how all that might have affected her emotionally or mentally? You mentioned that she was very guarded and very private, but do we know how those deaths might have affected her? Because those are people that she knew and that she worked with. That's that right. Worked. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, in the excerpt that I read from, I note that she was really broken up by the death of Medgar Evers. Um, he was her constant companion when she was in Mississippi. He drove her back and forth uh, to the courthouse, um, federal courthouse, where she was litigating the, that case. Um, and she tells stories, and this is from oral history, about how frightening it was being in Mississippi. Um, they would, there are instances where the state police was tailing them. Um, and, you know, Evers, who was accustomed to this, would say things to her like, don't look back, don't look back, just, you know, look straight forward, 
um, don't pay attention, but the state police um, are on our tail. And he, he would tell her, put that legal pad away. You know, don't, don't do your work. Put the legal pad inside the New York Times um, because he, he didn't want, if they were stopped, uh, the, the police to see that she was doing the intellectual work of the civil rights movement. And so she was, she was quite devastated by that death, um, by the death of uh, uh, Dr. King and experienced trauma, you know, from, from uh, some of those incidents. I, I title one of my chapters on the Meredith case um, it, it includes the word trauma. Uh, so James Meredith was famously, um, he appeared vacant when he was experiencing all of the, you know, the pushback as he was walking around on campus. He seemed to not have any expression. Um, but of course, inside he did. He was just wearing his armor in order to get through. And I would say that Motley had her moments uh, of being that way as well. And a part of the guardedness um, was because, you know, the situation demanded it. Um, she did not have time to, to sit in a corner and cry, which I'm sure she might have wanted to do on some occasions. I want to get a little bit more personal into her life. Would you say then she did sacrifice a lot in terms of her family, but has such a supportive husband, a supportive mate through all of this as well. And that was vital to her ability to do what she did. Um, she was married to a real estate broker, a Harlem real estate broker, uh, who fortunately uh, had his own office and so some flexibility, which allowed him to do things like, um, uh, chauffeur her to work every day when she was in, at the courthouse and then come and pick her up. And he would wait for her while she finished up. And, you know, she was a workaholic, everyone says. And so finishing up could stretch into one or two hours. And he was there for her. He was a co-parent uh, during an era when it just wasn't uh, typical for men to be fully invested in the um, in the caring for uh, a child and was just a doting spouse. And um, I think it's so special. I mean, it's atypical uh, of that era for yeah. um, a, a man to, to have a wife such as Motley and then to not be bothered by it. But I'll tell you something, Rose, that I think is, is revealing and sort of funny and strikes me as true. Um, when she was asked later in her life about her husband's support, she said, well, I wasn't making any money. If I had been making some money, <laughs> he might have had a, a problem with me, but he was always making more than her and had this independent business. And she thought that that was vital to um, his willingness to, uh, you know, to, to in some sense uh, uh, be overshadowed by her. Did you get everything you wanted into this book? You mentioned it's 400 pages and it is 400 pages. So it may be hard to believe that maybe you didn't, but did you get everything in here that you wanted? I would say so. I, I might've covered some of her business cases in detail. This is from her time on the court, but I thought, um, and, and here's why I thought of doing that. One of the themes of the book is about how being the civil rights queen is a double-edged sword. So her identity was weaponized against her. It's one of the reasons that she wasn't promoted to the Court of Appeals or to the Supreme Court. And um, you know, it, it meant that the cases for which she was most famous as a judge were civil rights cases. Um, and I, I thought that it, it might have been nice to write one more chapter about a business case just to break the pattern. But it is true that the most important cases that she decided tended to be in the civil rights realm. And so um, I compromised by in the epilogue citing some of those cases, but I didn't go into detail. 
I want to get into some questions before we end our conversation. And this is one from Kate. Kate writes, as the first black woman appointed to the federal bench, what advice do you think she would have for the first black female Supreme Court justice? Hmm. Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, in terms of the nomination and confirmation process, she might say, buckle your seatbelt, right? Um, because as we've already seen, um, it's, it's going to be trying, it's going to be challenging. And these nominees are put in a position of not really being able to speak except within the context of the hearing itself. And so over the past few days, you know, you've heard Joe Biden speaking and Joe Manchin and Jim Clyburn and, uh, you know, uh, others, but, but the women themselves can't speak. Um, and, uh, you know, so they, they aren't able to define themselves really and have to rely on others to define them. And I know if that is something that Motley was sensitive to. She also would, would say though, um, she would note that there is some weight that comes with representation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and yet ultimately, Motley, um, she decided cases in the way she thought they needed to be decided based on the law and the facts. And once she was on the bench, although some people thought that she would just be a mouthpiece for the movement, she, she actually was not. Um, she called them as she saw them. And that meant that sometimes she wasn't ruling um, in the way that uh, some thought she should, given her background as a civil rights lawyer. And so I, I know that she would advise uh, the nominee to do the same. Was Queen Motley ever embraced by her white peers on the bench? Now, I got to tell you, I hope you all can hear me. Can you all hear me? Yes. Hey, there's a picture in the book. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I'll let you explain it, but it's, she stands out. And I think this picture says a, a lot, but I'll let you answer that. Was she ever in, embraced by the white peers, by her white peers on the bench? Yeah. So remember, she was on the bench for decades. Uh, and at the end of her judicial career, she had been joined by Sonia Sotomayor, who was a, a judge on the Southern District before she went to the Court of Appeals and then the Supreme Court, um, Kemba Wood, uh, and other, other women joined the bench during her time as a judge. At the beginning, things were a bit dicey, and she does, she, she does tell stories about how some of the judges, the men, uh, very clearly did not want her around. The most heartbreaking one um, that I recount in the book is the backstory to her never going to the cafeteria or hardly ever going to the cafeteria at the federal courthouse. And it was because when she first joined the bench uh, and went to that courthouse, to that cafeteria, um, one of her colleagues made it clear that he didn't want her there. And so she seldom went back. Instead, her law clerks would go and fetch her lunch. Um, and so it, it was a lasting legacy of, of exclusion, really, um, or of you know, the loneliness of being Constance Baker Motley for many, many years before other women and people of color started to join the bench. That did not happen um, very frequently until Jimmy Carter was appointed, uh, excuse me, was, was elected president. He appointed uh, a, a number of black and women judges, um, but that was, you know, many years before, uh, um, uh, while she was, she was alone for many years. Mm. Here's another question. Since she was married to a real estate broker, did she have input in federal fair housing legislation? Input in federal. I don't know that, um, she had input, but she was deeply interested in housing segregation and litigated uh, some of those cases and uh, in, in housing discrimination. In fact, um, when 
they moved to their apartment uh, on the in the West End. They actually they they desegregated the apartment building themselves and encountered initially a little bit of resistance, but uh, the the apartment owners thought better of that. <laughs> that would not that would not have been a good move to try to uh, exclude the the famous civil rights lawyer. Um, here's a question from Marguerite. She writes, over the years of writing your book, what did you find to be the great challenge to writing? Hmm. Well, I would say it's it's what I was mentioning before, that she was so private. And um, it's not only a matter of personality, it's that judges famously will go so far as to destroy their personal correspondence because they actually don't want people to know their thought process in deciding cases. And uh, oh. so there was that challenge and then just the challenge of her own personhood where she, she, didn't, she didn't want to divulge very much. All right, so what was Judge Motley's relationship with James Meredith after he was admitted to Ole Miss and after his graduation, do we know? Mm. Uh, we know a little bit. She helped, she wrote him a letter of recommendation for Columbia Law School um, and you know, noted that he ran for office. And I think she always had um, a, a soft spot for James Meredith. Um, he went through hell doing mm -hmm. what he did. And she respected that. She understood that. And uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that, you know, when he went through sort of a political evolution that she probably raised her eyebrows, but um, she was not a particularly judgmental person. She wanted to know what made people tick uh, and not so much to pass judgment. Um, and of course, she had been in politics herself uh, and it just had a good sense of what was required there and actually was um, notably endorsed by all three political parties when she um, ran for Manhattan Borough President, so Republican, Democrat, and I think it was called the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, good, good relationship with him. Um, and she felt responsibility to, to care for him as she did many of her clients. And I understand she was working on cases just even weeks before her death. Was it in 2005? 2005, yes. So she took senior status in 1986, I believe it was. But judges, even after they are formally retired, they can continue to hear and work on cases. And one of the things that I note is she um, was so gracious in inviting some of the new judges out to lunch and uh, saying to them, you know, give me your worst case. This is a story from Kimba Wood. Give me your longest trial and I'll take that off your hands as a way of giving them some space to uh, acclimate to the bench, which is just indicative of the way she lived her life. Just such a, a good, decent person and so supportive of others who came after her. And that's one of the most inspiring things about her. You know, she was first in so many contexts, but she wanted to make sure she was not last. You know, when we started this conversation, I talked about my research and going back and watching some of the interviews. And there was one interview where she says, I know that I know there are many young Blacks who view me as a role model. I'm aware of that. And then the interviewer replied, and you're glad about it, to where she responded, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a woman of few words uh, sometimes. Um, she knew what she meant to others. She, she, she enjoyed um, being noticed and known. Um, and I you know, had the experience when I was working in that same federal courthouse, clerking for another judge of seeing her essentially float through the hallways and people admired her. She was striking almost six feet tall. Um, and she, she certainly was a role model, um, a mentor. And I think that was very important to her. 
Here's a question for you. It's from Tierra. It says, I'm starting a Black student union in my school. Do you have any advice? For a Black student union? Huh. <laughs> uh, and in your, is this a high school? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, doesn't say, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, well, my, I, I, think it's, I think it's great to um, have community with others who can help you um, move along with your goals and support you when you encounter difficulties. So uh, glad to hear it. And this is from McCray who writes, did she ever regret joining the judiciary rather than continuing to litigate and argue cases before the Supreme Court and other courts given judges are restricted from making public statements or otherwise being involved in politics or social activism? Hmm. Good question. And I, I would say, no, she didn't regret it. Um, but there is some literature that raises the question of whether the appointment of people like Constance Baker Motley, Bob Carter, um, Thurgood Marshall to the bench had the perverse consequence of undermining the civil rights movement, right? You, you, all of these great lawyers and there, there are others too, Spotswood Robinson, uh, who were appointed to the bench and that took them out of the, um, the arena of struggle in the courts, and, uh, which is unfortunate. And, but I, I don't think she regretted it. And I think she liked being a judge. She really did. She thought that she was um, making a difference in the lives of many people. She was a fair judge. And I think that she got a lot of satisfaction from it. And correct me if I'm wrong, Dean, did she win nine of the 10 cases argued before the Supreme Court? She did. She did. Yes. Uh, wow. So quite a record there. You are an academic, obviously, and of course, you're an author. What's next for you? Hmm. What's next for me? Um, I'm not sure what's next for me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm enjoying my, um, my role in, in academia as an administrator. Um, I am able to uh, do a lot for a lot of people. I teach still, I was teaching today, a freshman seminar, and I, I love interacting with the students and um, trying to help them, many of whom wanna to go to law school, help them explain the advantages and disadvantages of using the legal system for uh, change. And uh, I, I'm not sure. Probably I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing for a while. Why do you think, though, Dean, there's still such a very, very small percentage of Black lawyers? I, I read these statistics every year to try to see, you know, where the other day I had a conversation about the medical field and how you know, there's such a small percentage of black males going into the medical field. And you, you counter that with, with the percentage of blacks in, 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 the, in the legal field in terms of attorneys. Why do you think that's still so low? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that one has to start early to prepare oneself for um, you know, these advanced degrees. And oftentimes, um, the, the students uh, aren't, aren't doing that. Maybe they're not thinking about it. They don't have role models. And of course, there's the enduring problem of uh, schools that are attended overwhelmingly by uh, um, people of color being underfunded, uh, which can lead to a lack of preparation, which has implications. And so I would say um, it, it's so important to uh, get people on the right track from an early age and to um, make sure that there are role models there. And, you know, at my uh, institution, the Radcliffe Institute, we have a, an emerging leaders program, which exposes uh, high school students to college students who, um, you know, have knowledge about how to pursue uh, certain careers. And, uh, you know, it, it's something that is, a real problem, and uh, I, I would commend uh, the legal field to um, you know people who who might have an interest in change or in working on Wall Street. It's it's a it's an invaluable tool for life. She writes, "I'm thinking of going into a field of study where there is almost no black women. 
what advice would you give in my situation? Mm. Well, I would say that you have to cultivate and find uh, mentors and sponsors uh, from a variety of backgrounds. Um, you know, if I had relied on the availability of black women as, as mentors or sponsors, I would still be where I started because there really were not until um, pretty late in my, my career and my uh, education and very few. And those who do exist tend to be overburdened by the need to mentor and sponsor um, uh, the, the women and people of color who end up in uh, you know, higher education and in these fields. So you have to look for uh, mentors elsewhere. Uh, you know, I, I feel like in my career, um, I've sort of just made people mentor me. I mean, <laughs> it, it, could, it, it could be the case that you know, some people might be a little uncomfortable. They don't know what to do with you. That's okay. You know, yeah. you have to learn how to, uh, you, you do have to do some work to, um, to, to let people know you're just a person and you have goals like everybody else. And I also think though, that uh, you have to, um, I think there are friends in a lot of different places. And I would just commend uh, trying to do your best to find role models and mentors wherever you can. And I'll add this, if you are in a position that you can and you have a little bit of time, you, you never know five minutes that you take with someone or 10 minutes or someone seeing you speak. Um, you never know how inspiring that is and what that can lead to for that individual. The final question is who should read Civil Rights Queen? Everybody, <laughs> everybody. I, I think it's a book that, uh, as I said, can be inspiring to a whole range of people. Gender is a lens. It's an intersectional uh, analysis of gender and I commend it to um, you know, anyone who wants to be inspired by this remarkable woman who did so much, uh, although she started out with so little. Absolutely. It's called Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality, Dean Tamiko brown Nagin. Thank you so much for taking the time. Good conversation. I wish I could have been in person, but thank you. Thank you, Rose. I enjoyed it. Claire, it's all yours. Of course. Thank you both so much for just such an intriguing conversation. Just what an incredible woman, incredible life. It's kind of hard to believe it was just one life, how much she did mm -hmm. um, during it. So um, Dean Tamiko Brown-Nagan, thank you so much for your scholarship and all of the just countless hours of work that went into that book. I can't even imagine. Hmm. Thank you, Claire, for having me. I appreciate it. And if you enjoyed tonight's conversation, they were only able to scratch the surface of what's in the book. There's so much more to uncover about this incredible woman. Uh, my colleague Monique just put the link to purchase the book from Atlanta History Center's museum uh -huh. shop, um, if you have not yet done so. And we have lots of exciting events coming up at Atlanta History Center, some virtual, some in person, but our next one is an in-person event, although we will have um, a live stream available on our website, if that's what you would prefer. Um, we're going to be hosting Imani Perry to discuss her new book, South to America. So we're so excited about that one. It's on February 15th. Um, you can grab tickets at atlantahistorycenter.com. Once again, uh, to our two guests tonight, Thank you so much for the conversation to everyone in the audience. Thank you uh, for taking time out of your Wednesday night to join us. And I hope everyone has a safe and wonderful rest of your night. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.